Welcome everyone today. My name is Dr. Megan Workman Larson. I'm the Director of Student Engagement at the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. We're super excited to have our panelists join us today as well as everyone as a participant to have a discussion about exploring creative identities and acts of persistence, especially in this digital age. I'm going to be introducing the panelists to you and then we're going to start with some questions. If you have any questions during the panel, please type them into the chat bar on the side and we'll get to your questions. We'll also have a time at the end of the panel for you to ask questions as well. We just ask that you keep your microphone mute and screen off for today um, and we'll get to there down the line eventually as well. So I wanted to introduce the panelists to you who range a variety of areas, expertise, um, creative disciplines from photography to composition to working as an activist to working as administrators in a variety of different ways. Uh, they are wonderful people. I know all of them personally, and I can't wait to have this conversation with you all. So for our first panelist today is Daniel Bernard Remain. Daniel is a Herberg Institute professor at ASU. He is a composer, um, performer, educator, social entrepreneur who has worked with a variety of different people in a variety of different ways. He is always enthusiastic, creative, and a wonderful collaborator. Our second panelist today is Elaine Kessler, who is a photographer, arts entrepreneur, and author. Elaine works in the Arizona area. She works in a variety of different ways and is immensely creative and compassionate as well. We also have Miguel Felipe, who I've known for 16 years now, who is a conductor and administrator who works specifically on creative programming and with young composers as well. Bob, unfortunately, was unable to join us this morning. So we're going to start our panel. This will be the last kind of screen share. It will be just a conversation after this point. So I wanted to start with a basic question for you all is how do you define yourself? I'll leave that really broad for right now. Uh, for me, the answer the answers changed. Um, you know, when we're younger, maybe we define it by our family or our geography, our hobbies, our, our skills. Um, I think I'm, I'm coming out of the next phase though, I hope, which was defined by my job. Uh, for a long time, my employment was um, a huge part of who I was, my identity, and I, I think maybe too much so. And now um, I think I'm, I'm starting to define myself by what I value, the things that I think are most important in this world and where I choose to spend my resources of time and uh, energy and pennies. Um, I feel, well, the short answer, maybe the professional answer, if you will, even has a little bit of evolution in it. I define myself as a um, black Haitian American composer. And that, you know, so much of how I've defined myself has been in opposition. Um, I learned early on that if I didn't define myself, someone else would. And oftentimes these uh, systematic definitions, if you will, institutional definitions weren't appealing to me. So I'm 50 years old. That means I have lived through being referred to as a Afro-American composer, African-American composer, composer, black composer. The thing that made the most impression on me was reading Frank Zappa's, um, one of his writings, I think it was with John Cage. He said when he would pass, he wanted on his tombstone a two-word definition, American composer. So that made a big impression on me, and that's right around the time I started doing work at the Center for Black Music Research with the great Dr. Sam Floyd and Dr. Dominique Renee DeLerma. And um, I became very conscientious about how the power of uh, uh, self-definition was very important to uh, my overlapping communities, one of which was the, the Haitian community. So um, uh, not ironically, you know, some 30 years later, if you Google search Haitian American composer, um, oftentimes my name comes up. And I only mention that because it just shows you the power of uh, repetition and being very calculated. And I would even say uh, perhaps strategic about uh, how self-definition unfolds in, uh, our, um, in, um, in, uh, in our minority communities. Um, I have a really simple answer and um, it has evolved over time, but mine is as a creative who straddles borders and believes in possibility. And those borders include racial borders, ethnic borders, cultural borders, religious borders, health borders, and artistic borders. So I believe I'm a straddler. 
how do, how do you think about your own creative identity? Is it different than how you define yourself personally? And does it change? Does it change depending on context? We're going to start out with the light, fluffy questions today. Um, so I'm just wondering yeah. about when we think about like I like I work with college students a lot, and I think they struggle a lot of times with who they how do they think of themselves as a creative. And then how that intersects with their personal identity. I was wondering if you had any ideas about how yours changes, or does it change? Are you curious more about our process in thinking about this, or the result, what we've concluded? Both. I would say process is really important for this. Uh, well, I used to separate the two. I mean. In 1975, when I started playing the violin, it was very clear to me that young black boys, young boys of color, didn't play the violin. I mean, that's all I saw. Um, I got to middle school, and it got worse. You know, it, it, to carry a violin case put my physical body in jeopardy for real. So I started making separations. I mean, I didn't tell anybody I played the violin. I did football and soccer and all the things that my friends were doing, my boyfriends were doing. But um, playing the violin and being a creative person in that sense wasn't one of them. At the same time, I saw myself as a football player and violinist by the time I got to high school. And then I just stopped doing athletics completely. Um, I, I, think, I think for me, um, the, the, one of the biggest changes when I got to New York City in, in 1997 was I didn't feel a need to separate anything whether it was administrative work for various dance companies, comp composition work, violin work. I did a lot of work you know, accompanying dance companies. That was my bread and butter. All types of dance classes and movement classes and exercise classes and everything. So I think for me, New York was the first time where I felt an empowered. I didn't, I didn't have the term at the time, but I felt empowered to have a singular creative practice. That was an accumulative. That was an accumulative practice of many different practices. I, I think for me, and maybe I'm almost reacting to what you're saying there. I, I like what you're, you're thinking. I I started to define myself less by what I do, but why I do. And so, um, what I do is depending on who's going to pay me, <laughs> um, uh, who's not going to fire me, where where the work is, and what what's needed in a particular community. Um, and so, that's. Um, and obviously, the things I, I choose not to do, um, and hopefully things I, I can choose to do, but that's very much determined by where I end up, and as I learn about a community, what was needed. So the why for me is people. Um, I ask my students at the beginning of the year, are, are you uh, somebody who comes to music and in, enjoys the people um, as they make the music, or are you somebody that comes to the people and enjoys making music while spending time with the people? It, it, it's it's which is the driver and it's changed for me as a as a conservatory kiddo I was all about the music and um, well golly wasn't I elite and it, it's just changed I, I the music's great I still love it it still feeds me but that's not the point and so I define myself as a person who brings books together and helps them to be the best they can be so my creative identity um, spans a bunch of different things that I pursue, um, but in all of them, what I'm trying to generate is possibility. And I don't see that as distinct from how I define myself personally. Um, I, I, I believed as I was growing up that I wanted to compartmentalize my identities. I thought that was important. And now as um, I've gotten older, I find a lot of freedom in not being too contextual with my identities. Like I am the same person. Um, in all contexts. I am a creative who straddles boundaries and um, and I believe in possibility. So that's um, that's how I ground myself personally and professionally. Was there a turning point for any of you when you kind of made that shift from thinking about your identities into like finding your why, your values, or the possibility? And what happened to cause that shift? For me, it was Hawaii. I moved to Hawaii um, not for palm trees or coconuts, but for a gig. And I, just, I was really lucky. I just applied, I didn't know anybody, I got the University of Hawaii. Um, in Hawaii, the, the value system is distinct, it is strong, it, is, it permeates all, and it is completely different than what I grew up with. Um, the accentuation of, of 
accuracy, technical quality, and all the things that the conservatories of, of Euro influence prized, just wasn't really the topic in Hawaii. Uh, the, the music was coming from a different place. It was fulfilling a different need. And it, it was in being so out of step that I realized, wait a second, maybe, uh, maybe it's me here. Maybe it's not all of them. And uh, I was given a, a very gentle and a patient education. So my turning point was actually having children. Um, having children was not in my, I didn't grow up thinking I was gonna have kids and then um, suddenly there were kids. And so um, as a creative, uh, I had to really place some emphases on what I thought was important. And um, I see uh, one of my kids is actually on this call, which I think is really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, when, when I had kids, I had to really streamline where I was gonna put my, put my time, put my energy, and uh, things really shifted once they came along. And I have, I've been really lucky because they're very respectful most of the time of my creative processes. Um, and uh, so yeah, for me, the turning point was having kids 14 years ago, uh, and that really just shifted the whole landscape of who I was creatively. Oh, I, I, <laughs> yes, children will do that, won't they? I, I see Zachary, my 10-year-old son, as a very important teacher. He has definitely started Zoom bombing and infiltrating my various chat rooms. I don't think he'll do it today. He's in school right now, but <laughs> he did it with Opera Philadelphia, which I thought was awesome. And um, I mean, I love the fact that his 10-year-old existence up, up until this point is so much different than mine. That was a turning point for me. Um, you know, I was 10 years old, I had this big afro, I was going to Sunday school and then mass, and then my father would drive me to the Broward County Community College Youth Symphony, and I'm sure part of my cuteness got me into this orchestra. It was just such a magical thing. You know, to me, it was like a thousand people, probably 80, and they were all teenagers, 20, 30, you know, teenagers and 20, 30, 40 years old. And I was sitting in the second violin section, the last chair. That I even knew then that made you the worst player. But I didn't care. I was there, and I, we were playing Brahms Academic Festival Overture, and I practiced that thing, and I wore a tie, and I polished my black shoes, and I went in there trying, 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 and I made a mistake in New York. And Dr. Charles Noble, he stopped the whole orchestra, and he said, you, young man, right there, you made a mistake. That's your mistake. Stand up. Apologize. And I started shaking. I said, I'm sorry. He said louder. I started crying. And I remember looking at my stand partner, who at that time I thought was going to save me. I had a crush on her. She was probably 27. I looked around. Everybody had their head down. Nobody was there. Nobody. And even then, as a 10-year-old boy, I thought, you know, this is wrong. Nobody was going to speak up for me. Nobody was going to stop this attack. And it went on. I want you to apologize. I want you to practice these measures. Play, the, you know, play, an, play part of it right now. I mean, it was such a, like a lashing, you know. I'm still talking about it. And I only say that to you because, you know, this many years later, I'm a composer. I'm on the board for the League of American Orchestras. I have this relationship specifically to the orchestra, but in a more general sense to classical music, that in some ways was a response to not letting him control my destiny. Even at 10 years old, you know, I knew that I wanted somebody to say, that's not your mistake, that's our mistake. Let's not make the same mistake twice. You know, whatever the language was then, it didn't appear, but it's here now. And I think that that was an important turning point for me because I think there's a real wisdom in children, there's a wisdom. I mean, Megan, you are a teacher to me. We were in a class together. That's how I would frame it, right? Elaine, you were and remain a teacher to me. We were in a class together. And all of that stems from that moment where I felt um, uh, uh, traumatized. But I also, even as a 10 year old, I saw it as an opportunity. That's a great story of persistence, especially and how as creatives we move through different spheres and contexts and how you find that sense of self. Um, I wonder if you could all talk to me a little bit about kind of your journey of persistence over time as people uh, in places of very different contexts now, most likely than you were when you started out on this adventure, either as a conservatory trained elitist 
or someone who was studying something else or being berated by the tradition of classical music, what made you persevere? And what does that look like over time? Um, I find myself uh, going back to the previous question of not what I do, but why I do. And um, I have this, um, I think many of us do this need to identify with and support the margin, um, those at the margin, the underdog. And uh, that led me to work very unexpectedly. Um, as a queer man, I was involved in gay lesbian choruses and things like that, kind of, well, obviously he would do that. But then I found myself in graduate school matched with a professor whose work was all about Southeast Asian choral culture and editions and publishing and travel. And I thought, this has nothing to do with me. It, um, it had everything to do with me. And I, I found that it was just another identity that put people at the margin. And I thought, well, wait, I'm at the margin and you're at the margin, let's talk. And I, I persisted in trying to understand and get into a community where I was not immediately um, welcomed or thrown out. I just wasn't part of it and found that there in Southeast Asia and also in Hawaii, just presence and um, consistency and honesty and openness and quiet um, was often the most effective form of persistence. Um, and it's difficult for me as a kind of a Eurocentric Germanic type where you push and you get results. Um, in those cultures, it was you wait you wait and then results come when it's the right time and that uh that was very difficult for me if megan if you know me that's it's not how i work um and so persisting in my own inabilities persisting in trying to understand what others want and need and who they are and how they value um it, it's taken years and i i think i may be halfway there i don't know yet. the journey of persistence has been um a bumpy one um for me, mental health has been tricky to navigate over the years. And uh, you bring up Southeast Asian uh, studies, uh, Miguel, and uh, my family is from Thailand. And in Southeast Asia, a lot of times uh, for many different cultures, so, uh, mental health is considered uh, kind of a gift. And there are different ways to perceive and understand mental health issues. And uh, my grandmother was a fortune teller but she was also probably schizophrenic. Um, she was treated for all kinds of, she heard voices. And um, she always encouraged me to believe in the things that I heard or the things that I felt. And um, as a result of that, I was able to navigate some of the stuff that was really tricky for me and come out on the other side and have a clearer sense of self. Uh, I believe that everybody wrestles with mental health stuff at some point in their lives. I, I just, that's, I think that's a thing. Um, and for myself, uh, having peace about some of the hiccups that I've had has been really freeing and liberating. Um, you know, in college, in undergrad, in college, uh, that was when I first discovered Sri Maraga and Gloria Hansel Dua, their writings. And those writings really spoke to me about straddling boundaries. And then when I got to graduate school at ASU, we did more work on straddling boundaries and learning about different ways uh, that these identities intersect. And um, I was able to see how my mental health component intersected with all these ways of being, and it really complemented uh, my creative uh, identity. So uh, persistence for me has been a bumpy journey, and, uh, but one that is, has been amazing. Like I, I wouldn't have asked for it any other way. And uh, I do believe that creative persistence incorporates uh, pivoting. Uh, and that's what we've had to do in the last 60 days or so uh, for most of our industries pivot quite a bit. Um, and it's, it's been, it will be good. That's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say it will be good. I'm not gonna say that it is good. I'm gonna say that it will be good. I love that uh, creative persistence and pivoting. I, I think it's, it's, it's really important. Those are great terms and strategies. Um, uh, it, it's so wonderful to hear um, Miguel and Elaine uh, expound upon this. I, I would say for me, um, I, my my I would narrow mine to conflict and canvas by that I mean when I was growing up I, I saw a lot of conflict minor conflict you know two sisters uh, seeing my parents argue in the home 
um, having um, these heated debates, even as an elementary school teacher with some of our student, with some of my teachers. But um, I just saw a lot of conflict. Um, I observed a lot of conflict. And as I got older, I started participating in the conflict. And um, as I'm, as I'm older even now, I noticed I was able to kind of frame the conflict. And by conflict, I mean, um, you can see in my language, which I, which I think is important, for me, persistence is rooted in this notion of conflict, in this notion of I'm not satisfied. But as a father, <laughs> I have to replace that word with canvas, because that, that's what I think actually happened. That when I was younger, I was observing things, you know, and it was good. I saw a lot of wonderful things and I saw things that maybe weren't so wonderful, but in terms of my creative practice, it was important for me to see all of these things. A, a mother who was a nurse in South Florida in the 80s, at the height of multiple crises, taking care of multiple people, um, as I got older, I was in the canvas, right? I, I actually could participate in, in my creative um, uh, uh, st uh, st uh, strategy or, or journey. And now that I'm even older, um, I can frame. I can frame this, the canvas for others, uh, for institutions in various ways, as a board member, as an educator, so on and so forth. So mentor. So I, I think that's, words are important, and I think that the notion of a canvas that I'm participating in, observing, participating in, and now framing, has is what's given me what I call what I would call a personal creative morale, and and we can get back to that. But that personal creative morale is, I think, perhaps the difference between a sense of paralysis right now for art artistic community, or a real. Um, determination to push ahead in our creative practice. I saw lots of shaking and noddings of heads to personal creative morale. Would you tell us a little bit more about that? And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that, Elaine and Miguel, as well. Uh, I would say quickly, for me, my personal creative morale has to do with, uh, in, in some ways, a self-responsibility. You know, my mother used to say, when someone dies, when someone leaves the earth, they take a little piece of, of, of you with them. It's a Creole thing. I can't translate it. I'm so sorry. But, you know, when we think about these horrific numbers in our communities and our nation worldwide of people who are just leaving the earth in the in, in this in the space of this panel, we're losing people. People are taking their last breath. I'm breathing. People are taking their last breath. That sense of taking a piece of you and beyond empathy, it I think it what leads to a kind of a paralysis an inability to operate as a creative person even though we have quote unquote time. So creative, for me, creative per personal morale is in some ways the strategies to stay creative. What are all the little and big things that we do, the routine? What is the routine now of the creative person? Uh, without getting into the weeds, one of my routines is um, getting up and stretching and making tea and watching and observing and just listening to music. That listening to music to me right now is an important part of me being a composer. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a great um, personal creative morale. I love this. Um, and I would say to riff a little bit off of what Daniel's saying is, yeah, being responsible for what I what I am and who I am is is a big part of my, my personal creative morale and also being committed to generating possibility. So um, as long as my endeavors are in the pursuit of possibility, I feel like I am committed or um, aligned with the morale. Um, and as far as routines are concerned, I think that reading every day is important and I think that listening to music every day is important. I'm not a composer, but um, I think that the gift that music is, um, is profound um, and it really propels me through a lot of uh, tough stuff. So, yeah. Well, they've taken all the good answers, so um, I have nothing to add. Uh, I, I think uh, for me, it, I have to remind myself that the, the, the product is not the end all and be all. Um, going back to Hawaii and how that was a, a change of, kind of reference for me, um, the choir scene moving from Boston, Massachusetts, a mecca of kind of um, European art culture in North America to Polynesia where orchestra, eh, 
um, it, it, it made me reframe why I do what I do and what I, what's important about what I do, um, the process, and that I'm not just an artist, I'm an educator. And part of the job of the educator is to let that light in other people, um, or at least offer opportunity. And so to me, I found motivation or kind of this morale in remembering that um, the, the process is long, you have many chances, you can always bring your best intention and integrity to each day, um, that everyone gets second chances and that the concert really just doesn't matter. Um, that's not true, but it's an admission that the world of um, perfection and the world of honoring our um, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, it, it's not all there is, there's more. And the process, the, the pursuit of beauty, um, the recognition of humanity, the, the, um, the delight in error, those are the things that free me to be creative and to celebrate what I am, flaws included. I think it's really interesting. You've all talked about kind of the process and I, one of the part of being creative and from talking to lots of creatives is that most people are lifelong learners. They're always learning. They're always creating new things, but it's both an inward and outward kind of experience. You have spent a lot of time developing that inner empathy, that inner kind of voice of how you treat yourself and how you think about yourself as a person and interact, but then you also have to think about your broader context. Um, I think from working with students, the idea is that a lot of times the final product and kind of how you interface with the world is the shiny sparkly component and that the inner stuff should be easy. But it seems like talking to you all that all the inner stuff, it seems like it's a long process and you words, use words like bumpy and conflict and like strategy. I was wondering if you agree with me on that or if you had any ideas or suggestions that things that maybe you would have told your younger self when you're kind of delving into the internal kind of heavy lifting that goes into kind of being a persistent creative? For me, the, one, of the token, one of the signs of maturity is the ability to simultaneously see um, a goal that's perhaps years away and see today's work. To be able to sit down to do today's work, to celebrate its completion, to be satisfied, without forgetting that goal, um, to, to learn how to pace ourselves and how to bite off just the right amount to chew. I think that um, the ability to do that allows us to do long-term projects and to carry on um, this bumpy path uh, and, and developing that patience and that dual vision of short and long-term. I think that that's a really important step on the way to artistic and human maturity. Um, I would offer that as, well, as one thought uh, along these lines. So I would say um, to my younger self or to people younger than me, um, start being responsible for yourself and your emotions. Like own the fact that you are having the experience that you're having and remember that you're the source of all things. Um, don't blame yourself don't blame others for your setbacks. Be responsible for those setbacks. Um, own your deficiencies. And even more important than owning your deficiencies, I think it's really important to own your accomplishments. I think it's really easy for creatives to let accomplishments slip by under the radar. And uh, I think it, even inventorying them or cataloging them, having a document that lists the things you're proud of and reviewing that, I think is a really great way to uh, empower ourselves as creatives because I just think it's easy to, uh, be obsessed with uh, the product and not the process. And when we do create a great product, we should remind ourselves that we did that and uh, we should own that. I'm so sorry, Megan. Can you uh, repeat the question one more time? I want to make sure I... Oh, I think you're muted. You'll have to make it up there. Um, <laughs> about how, talking about kind of the internal process, um, that you had along the way in terms of developing like your mental acuity or kind of helping your self mental health and self-care components while also interfacing with the world and how there are a lot of times just seen as that should be easy because it's you 
but it's not. And I was wondering if you agree with that and if you had any advice for your younger self. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, I and I recall you saying, you know, recall you saying most people are learners and I remember thinking I wish more people were learners. <laughs> you know, that especially as we get older for whatever reason, there's somehow lack of knowledge or even learning is seen as a liability or a weakness. Um I I I think um I I know that for me just waking up in the morning and being alive is you know an affirmation and in some ways an act of defiance it's it's very very difficult it's really difficult i'm thinking now of our great the great loss of our great professor uh, marcus white and um you know i'm i'm thinking about how for for in this moment during this global pandemic and what would the, what will this conversation mean a year from now or 10 years from now and someone may be watching it right um i think that being alive right now, taking good, honest, deep breaths is enough, is more than enough. I, and I think it was that way even before. I think that for so many of us, there is this pressure, this horrible pressure to have the answers, to know everything, to be successful. And so many of these categories and, and, and definitions are defined by others, right? And there's expectation and expectation changes and it abounds. And there are rules and expectations that artists are somehow uh, are supposed to both simultaneously adopt, right, and reject, <laughs> right? The great Bill T. Jones would often remind me, artists are the one, are the, are the only humans on the planet that should be able to do anything they want whenever they want, right? So... You know, my sense of this is, especially right now, is that I, I want to be very cautious and very careful and start with the notion of being alive is really important. Uh, telling people that I care about them and love them is very, very important. That my job and my obligation right now is to myself and my family and my son and my mother and my community. And somewhere in all of that, I hope that the creative work can happen and my professional um, responsibilities can persist but I think it's I'm speaking now of perhaps you know value and you know when I think about it um, uh, I don't um, Pearl Lang the last great Graham dancer she once asked the entire class you know what would you really die for not not in the hyperbolic hyperbolic um, um, occasion not not a poetic who would you or what would you really die for? And I remember that because um, I remember thinking it certainly wouldn't be music, would not be my art, you know? And I think about that every day. I would certainly give my life to my son and my mother and my sisters. That's easy. You know, those, those answers for me come quick. And in, and in that kind of a challenge, what would you surrender your life to? What cause or person? Uh, I think there's important work for all of us there, even beyond our, our, our artistry. I think there's a lot about others in terms of expectations from other people outside of you, but also the others who are your support network and people who helped you along the way to become who you are, who challenge you and ask you questions. Um, who are the people who've helped you along the way or supported your creative persistence? Who are the people who really challenged you to think in a different way? Were they from your discipline? Were they from your family? I'd love to hear some stories about the people on the support side. My husband um, is, it, and it's not because he's cute or anything like that. It's because, which he is, if he's here, I have to make sure he hears that. Um, no, the point is that I'm a, a, just a bulldozer sometimes um, because it's been effective. At some point I learned that if you just push and you're loud and you talk faster and harder, you'll get things. And it's worked for me a lot. But as you might suspect, there's some collateral damage sometimes and I might miss some points. Um, he's the one person I know because of his personality and his laid back nature that if he says, stop, that I have to stop. Um, because he's happy to let me go. He says, do your thing, I don't care. Un until something needs to happen. And so. For him, when he offers critique, like, that, you know, that rehearsal was kind of, that was kind of bad. Or, um, are you sure you want to do that? Or, 
I really like that piece. You know, that type of feedback from a person that I trust at the absolute lowest depths of his person. I, I trust everything about him. That feedback is spectacular. And, and he often um, couches it, well, I'm not a, a blah, 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 but I said, just shut up. I, you are a person who loves music and that's, that's my audience. Um, so, so tell me, what, what's, what do you hear? And um, I go to the bank with that. So it's an interesting question because I think that the support, people who support you tend to be cheerleaders and people who support your creative persistence tend to be maybe, maybe somewhat antagonistic, possibly. Um, they stretch you, they grow you. And I've had lots of uh, great teachers over the years that have uh, helped contribute to my professional development. Um, in terms of creative support, I would say similar to Miguel, I have a fantastic partner who is very different from me. He is a business analyst and um, not at all uh, aligned with my high risk taking uh, motivation. And, um, and he's also my biggest fan. So uh, whenever I come up with some idea that I think might be really cool, uh, he always gives me, he tempers it a little bit with his, his perspective. And that's really helpful. Um, and I think, I, I don't know where it was, but somewhere in my industry, I'm, I'm in photography, um, somebody said, there's enough art in the world for everyone to be making some and for everyone to be making money off of the art that's possible to be created. And that helped really revolutionize my perspective on competition. So I don't see people as competitors so much anymore as artists in their own right. And people of all sorts have different styles and they have different price points and they have different things that, that it matter to them. And so, uh, yeah, competition was totally reframed probably about eight years ago for me. And it's been, it, that's been super liberating uh, just to kind of get that, oh, people aren't my competitors, they're artists making art and there's enough for all of us to make. So, um, and I would say that, yeah, my community is probably my biggest support system in terms of cheerleading me on. Uh, my partner is my greatest uh, perspective check. And then uh, the perspective that competitors are, or, or other artists are not competitors has uh, been really helpful. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to just go, uh, I'll try to be creative about this. Um, I'll try to maybe go left to right. I pro probably... Probably in my mother's womb, the the um, records my father was playing. Um, then my, my mother, my father, my younger sister who voted for Michelle Obama, loves Michelle Obama. My older sister who, who will tell you I didn't just vote for Trump, I love Trump. Mr. Miller, my first music teacher, taught me how to play Hatikva. Still hear his voice. Miss Hieronymus, uh, grades two through five. We were the gifted kids and we had our own portable and it was magical. Every day we would change the chair. She would change the way she looked. And, and sometimes we could teach the class. Uh, Miss Griffiths, my uh, elementary school, uh, a middle school uh, orchestral teacher who left when I was going into seventh grade. And then even Mrs. Black, who was a young woman, first year teaching, who just she didn't know what she was doing. You know, as they say in the South, bless, bless, you know, God bless them or bless, you know, bless her soul, bless her. Um, in, 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 a, in a high school, Dr. Dr. Pinkston, um, uh, uh, Fred Kunish, who passed away a few years ago, uh, at Vanderbilt University, Dr. Rose, Dr. Keurig, University of Michigan, Bill Bulcom. Um, at University of Michigan, this graduate student who said something to me about time management, I can still see his face, changed my life. Um, at oh, Colleen Jennings Rogensack, Michael Reed, um, Vo, you know, this young dancer who he's here right now, Gregory Sale, you know, taking over Alcatraz, uh, Professor Marcus White, you know, my father passed away seven years ago. I still dream about him. I get it now. You know, Zachary, who is 10 years old and is all athlete and challenge. Prince, who continues in so many ways to really have charted this very clear path between creativity and community and uh, consciousness. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for sharing about that. We do have a question about 
How do you reclaim your creative self-identity, and especially in the aftermath of trauma or conflict? And how do you learn how to reconnect with your art or your creative craft? Do you have any suggestions in that area? It's, there you go. I was first. No, please, ma'am, please go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go quick. We'll, um, I think that, um, well, let me go into the weeds for a second. Um, uh, I can say this quickly. I, for me, um, I've never had writer's block. I have too many ideas. The, the faucet's always on. And I, I have too many ideas for this lifetime. But um, there are times when I'm just tired. I just don't want to do it. I have to do it. I just don't want to do it. So I developed something called one for one, two for two, three for three. I compose for one minute. Not an idea, not a sketch. I literally put the timer on, I compose something for one minute, I stop, then I listen back to it. If I'm with one or more people, then I, we all do it and we all critique for one minute. Two for two, I compose for two minutes, stop. It's a, it's a complete work and then I listen back to it. And I'll keep doing this. And what I found is in a day, by the time I got to 10 to 10, mm -hmm. 10 for 10, 15 for 15, I now feel so empowered. You know, an hour I can write an opera. <laughs> That's how it feels. So that's one way. That's really in the weeds. But but what I mean by that, I want to be specific that I have found very specific strategies towards what I call exercising your imagination muscle. And I don't mean that in a condescending way or something for children even, but I do. I think I think imagination, like any part of our body, any part of our psyche, it needs to be exorcised. It needs to have um, life blood pumped in and out of it. It needs to contract and release, right? So that's one strategy that I developed for myself and I can share with others, right? That you're, you're doing something very specific for a very short amount of time. You know, in physical exercise, we might call this HIT, high intensity intervallic training. It's the same principle, but I'm applying it to a creative act. That snaps you out of, you know, for me, my God, the blank page, hours, hours. I don't have anything next week, y'all. Nothing. That is terrifying to me. Because I'm sure everybody on this call is type A personality. All that time, you should be doing, right, a million. Th no, the opposite I am finding, the opposite. So I have found a way to kind of exercise and take ownership of my imagination muscle. Super great. I think that, um, yeah, with, with having a blank slate, like there's a lot of rest that's incorporated for me, um, getting the chance to rest and change uh, my environment and also change my instrument. So I I was used to picking up a big DSLR camera every day for for you know every, for the last several years. And um, when I wasn't uh, getting to do that, I started using my phone and trying to experiment with different ways of using my phone to take great pictures. And then I started experimenting with drawing and just sketching and just using a different instrument um, uh, to exercise the creative muscle, as you say, Daniel. Um, and changing the environment. So, you know, we we dipped out of, of town, uh, even during this quarantine, we, we got an Airbnb in a local city, a nearby city, and it was a great change of pace. It um, spurred my creative energy a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think that change of pace, change of scenery, and change of instrument are ways to go in order to uh, reclaim your self-identity. And then in terms of trauma, I mean, I guess when I think of trauma, and I'm looking at DP's question, um, in the aftermath of trauma, uh, it is just a, it is a pivoting. Like it, you know, when, when something happens, you have to pivot. And I think that's what uh, change of scenery and, and change of instrument can do for you. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, don't give it up altogether. Just pivot a little bit. In neurological studies, now they're, they're, they're saying exactly what you, what you felt or feel um, uh, or sense, they're, they're proving absolutely, you know, this idea that um, a, a young person should have a place in the, the home where they always go after school to do schoolwork, and that's their dedicated schoolwork area. It's horrible that, that you learn everything in such a fixed scaffold that um, you can only recall it and use it when you return to that scaffold. Instead, you should be out playing kickball while, you know, working on your spelling and, and um, going for a walk while you sing your um, arias because you, in Embrace the full network of, of the kind of complicated brain and, and tie those experiences throughout your brain so that they become integrated to you as a, uh, within you as a whole person. Um, for me, the greatest challenge um, and the place where I can always return 
is uh, practicing quieting of my um, somewhat overdrive brain. Um, and what I have to do is I have to find tasks that put me not at the level I am right now where I'm fully conscious, fully able to just engage and go, but at the same time, the other end, which is sleep, where I'm not conscious. I have to find something which puts me in between and holds me there. Uh, it, this isn't, you're going to think meditation or prayer or something. Um, for me, it's driving on the highway. Um, because when you're driving, you shouldn't um, be engaging in anything like texting or um, uh, work. Uh, so I'll drive two hours up to Phoenix uh, with the radio off. Um, I will not call anyone. I'll turn the phone off. I will just be in pure, complete silence, which people think is very creepy. Um, but it's at that level where I can't fall asleep. I'm engaged enough but I have no work. And my brain just explodes. I, it's, I don't even have to do anything. It always happens. Um, but the brain just explodes. I keep a paper nearby and all the best projects I've ever done have come from car drives. Um, where, the, where, the, where my brain has that freedom. Um, it's awake, it's engaged, but it's not busy. And then it flows. I find as a creative as well that I have to think through different modalities to get or try different structures to get unstuck when I feel stuck sometimes. And then I agree with you when I find that kind of sense of calm, a lot of times ideas will come out of nowhere and being able to kind of tap into that is so key. You all mentioned ownership or owning your own accomplishments at some point. Is there a time that you maybe stepped back and didn't own your accomplishment and would you like to own it right now? Like what's something that you would like to really own as an accomplishment as someone who's working through all these pursuits? That, that's so interesting to me. I, I, I've, I don't think anyone, anyone, I've never even heard this question. Such a great question. Um, I, I, you know, my mother, I was raised in, in a Haitian household. So part of being a Haitian person is, uh, is an, is a, is a is a rondo a repetition of selflessness so early on um um oh, what is the term that you just used own your accomplishments right so early on it was so understood that you never owned your accomplishment it was always the result of you were just a part of your accomplishment right so what you owned was your failure actually that was yours you got a b minus in a class why didn't you get an a if you got straight A's, wow, my mother would say, you see, you got two smart parents, <laughs> but it was great. It was a great sense of no. And, and I and I actually hold that to be true. I mean, I feel that um, for me, I see myself. Well, uh, it's even hard for me to say it. I see myself as a successful person, rel you know, fine. But so much of that is the result of my family, my home, my great teachers, everyone that I mentioned, um, my environment, my education. Um, you know, I am the proud, I would say the proud product of the Broward County public school system and, and the failures. Absolutely. I, I continue to make mistakes. I embrace my failures. My failure, my failures are my own. So um, that that's, and again, that's just cultural. That's the way I was raised. So the, um, the owning of accomplishment is, is a very interesting term to me. And I would just say that I feel much more comfortable saying I own my failure and my accomplishments are, have always been shared. Oh, go for it, Elaine. All right. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of owning accomplishments, I think that it can, I don't know that I have, have anything that I want to be acknowledged for right now, but um, I, I guess surviving and sustaining, you know, Daniel talked about getting up in the morning, being, taking that first breath and like, or the, you know, waking and acknowledging that first breath. I think that's important for all of us to acknowledge and be proud of um, that we get to live to see another day. Um, but I do think that keeping a catalog of things that you are proud of in your life can make a difference in those periods of time where right now, when you're coming out of trauma, um, and you're not sure where to go or what to return to, you can always uh, take stock of where you've been. And I think that can help rebuild us. Uh, so I do, I have, I have a, a document that I call affirmations and they're testimonials and they're also like things that I'm personally proud of that, that I've accomplished. Um, and 
that makes a difference. I forget to look at it frequently, but um, every time, every now and then when I'm looking through my documents and I see it, I, I'm like, oh yeah, there, there's something to remember and there's something to, to go back to, to kind of um, return to and build from. And so owning your accomplishments, I think is really important. And of course, I think that uh, we've all been taught in a lot of ways to own our failures and that they're individually our failures. So I think it is countercultural to own your accomplishments. Um, and as creatives, I think it is really kind of important to, to do that, to make that a practice. This is fascinating. Yeah, I, I've, never, I've never thought about it quite the way you posted, Megan. I, I, I'm an academic and um, academics have to update their CVs annually, have to write dossier, have to constantly um, explain why they're valuable. Um, and for it, we earn grand sums of money and great respect in society, right? So that was sarcasm. Um, I, I, I feel like I have to catalog my, my successes. And I, am I a jerk for saying this isn't difficult for me? I feel gross, but <laughs> like I have written on paper catalogic lists of every little doodad I've done. But um, I, I think that this act perhaps draws me away from the why and puts me back in the what. What have you done? List every high school choral clinic you've done in service to the recruiting goals of the school. Blech. It, it is important and, and without that we don't go on, but um, the why, well, what did you do there? And, 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 and you can't document this or get credit for it, but what have you um, brought to this environment, this school, this teacher, those students? If there's one student who is moved by that event, then maybe you've done something um, that doesn't maybe give you a point towards tenure. So, which is important. Um, I think the thing I am most interested in and the thing I'm working on right now is, is continuing to think about um, the, your successes as part of a, a longer goal that involves more people and that serves to benefit a greater good that you're part of something bigger and um, celebrate. And I don't know, um, if, if, I think if you're properly focusing yourself in the greater context, humility then comes about automatically. I do like from the conversation about how failure is a lived experience that seems so personal, but accomplishment is something that you tend to want to see in terms of community. And like, it's much easier to shine the light on your friend's accomplishments than it sometimes is even your own um, and how you kind of work through that as well. But I, I think I agree with you, Miguel, too. It's like when we talk about accomplishments, we talk about what. We don't talk about the whys or the questions that led us to those accomplishments. And I think that's the big part of being a creative is having those, con like those questions that you live behind the scenes versus focusing on the out product. So that leads me to my final question for you all. Um, what's a question that you want to live moving forward around issues of your creative identity or persistence? Because we're not looking for solutions, we're looking for questions. So what's the question that you're going to live moving forward, especially in this digital age when connecting in person in our community is much more challenging? We have many pensive looks now. Are we allowed to use semicolons? I mean, great, great question. question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think about the iterative approach um, and each day is a draft and that we have, you know, some thousands of opportunities to, to, do, to do well. And so at the end of each day, you know, have I, have I made beauty? Have I made someone's life better? Um, or have I um, loved or done kindness? Hmm. I, I'm going to, I love that, Miguel. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? I need to hear that again. Uh, um, probably not, I don't know. Um, the, 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 the things that I value most, kindness, love, um, beauty and um, uh, togetherness, the, the support of each other, the, the community, the whole. I'm gonna to connect to that in this way. I almost feel like we can, might be able to make a chain. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it, Elaine. I'm gonna to connect to Miguel in this way and go, go ultra specific in 
because it's a, you're asking us for questions. Correct, Megan? All right. So my question is going to be for Arizona State University. Can ASU, is ASU, no, no, is Haida, Herberg Institute for Dining Arts, willing to engage in a sincere and deep process of truth, reconciliation, and rehabilitation led by artists in pivotal leadership roles and capacity? Oh, great. Now I got to add a link to that chain. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. <laughs> I, no, you do not. Sorry. I don't drag you into this madness. <laughs> so, well, as the probably only non-traditional academic on the, on the panel, I, I have a question that's more broad, I guess, for creatives. And I'm, I love this, the quote, um, a rising tide raises all ships. I love that quote so much. And that informs the whole competitor artist, uh, phenomenon that I was talking about earlier, but I guess what I'm most interested in figuring out is how a community of creatives can contribute to each other so that there's a mutual appreciation for both technical skill and socially um, and social skills. So I find that a lot of arts entrepreneurs or artists uh, tend to be really proficient technically or really proficient socially and um, sometimes so proficient in one area or the other that it, it um, does a disservice to the other. And I'm, I'm wondering how we as creatives can develop a mutual appreciation for both of those things as a practice. Um, so what can we do uh, as a whole body of people to pull us all up? Um, and so that's, that's one of the big questions that I have. Uh, I'm, I, I'm always struck by the young people that I, I do some mentoring and shadowing and when they come to me, they're really, really good technically or they're really, really good socially, um, but they are lacking the, the significance on both, um, the practice of both. And so I really want to know how can we together help uh, make a difference for uh, aspiring creatives or artists practicing to acknowledge both of those fields. Thank you all so much. So we have how can a community of creatives really support and appreciate each other? How can I love every day and create new drafts? And how can I engage in truthful reconciliation and leadership for all artists? Those are some really good questions to live forward. Thank you so much for your panel today. I, we're at 12 at noon right now. We do have another panel at one today talking about when space becomes risky. Um, that's sponsored by the National Accelerator for Cultural Innovation. And we have another panel next Thursday on the 28th that is about um, how rest can become resistance. Um, I'll share that information in the chat box as well. Thank you all so much for having this conversation with us today. If you want to hang out for panelists anymore, we can see if we have any more questions that come through the chat. And everyone who attended, thank you again for everything and being part of this community of creatives today and all of our acts of persistence.